Hello everyone, welcome to New Hope One Word. For those of you online and those of you here face to face, let's all stand to our feet and let's sing. This one thing I'm asking, one thing I'm needing, a moment that's passing, not what I'm seeking. Like it's the air I'm breathing, I want your presence, feet on the earth, heart full of heaven, zeal for you, completely consumes me.
Every knee must bow, every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord. Fear must bow down, cancer must bow down, every sickness, every fear, anxiety must bow down. And so the next verses as we sing together, let's declare the name of Jesus over ourselves, over our lives, over our marriage, our families, over what's going on in the world. Because breakthroughs will happen and strongholds will be broken. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you
thank you. Thank you for your joy that you restore in each and every one of us. And thank you that when we cry out to you with our whole heart, that you meet us where we are. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for today. Thank you for the message that you have for us. Thank you for the hope that you give us, Lord, each and every day through your word. So would you help us hang on to your word, hang on to your promise, not by what we feel or look at the circumstances around us, but to trust you in your word. We love you, we praise you, we lift you up, Jesus. And all of God's people said together, amen. Thank you for joining us here today at New Hope Windward. Before you are seated, go ahead and greet one another and enjoy the message. Welcome everyone, my name is Anna and I'd like to welcome you to New Hope Windward. Thank you for joining us for service today. In a few moments, we're going to hear a great message. But before we do, we're gonna take some time to worship God through our giving. Every day, our church is doing amazing things to advance God's plan to reach and grow people for Christ, not just locally here on the Windward side of Oahu, but also on the mainland and around the world. And as much as COVID-19 has been a major challenge for so many over the past year and a half, God will often take a bad situation and redeem it for His good. And as a church, we've been able to reach more people than ever during the pandemic, especially through our service online. In fact, an estimated 2,000 people on Oahu, the Outer Islands, places on the mainland, as well as faraway countries like South Korea, Germany, and the Philippines have been watching our adult, Kid Zone and youth services online every week. Since we reopened in-person services at Regal Cinemas in February, many who first started watching us online are now attending our in-person services. They've shared that they simply love being a part of our church and what God is doing through us to make a tangible difference in our community. The everyday work of New Hope Windward is made possible through your generosity. We simply would not be able to do church, whether in person or online, and reach as many people for Jesus as we have during the pandemic if it wasn't for your continued faithfulness in giving. Every day, hearts are being healed, lives are being transformed, and families are being restored by the power of Christ because of you. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see three easy, safe, and secure ways to donate. And by clicking the button on the upper right-hand corner of your screen, it'll take you to our website where you can give a one-time gift or have it recurring. Another way to give is by texting the word NEW DONATION to the number on your screen and follow the instructions. Or if you prefer to mail in your gift, you can send it to the address below. And if you're joining us for in-person services, you're welcome to drop off your donation in the donation drop box right outside each theater or use the giving kiosk located in the lobby at Regal Theaters. Would you bow your heads with me as I lead us in prayer? Father in heaven, thank you that in spite of the pandemic, as a church, we have the opportunity to partner with you to reach more hearts and lives than ever before. And whether it be in our own community, on the mainland or across the world, we are grateful for the many in our church who generously and selflessly give so that the daily work and ministry of New Hope Windward can continue to make a tangible difference for you and the lives of many. Bless them richly, Lord, in return for their sacrificial hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to welcome you to New Hope Windward. We'd love to keep you informed and updated with all that's going on. You can go ahead and text NEW GIFT to 45777 and we'll email you an Amazon e-gift card as our way of saying welcome. We'd love to stay connected with you this week. The easiest way to do that is by following us on social media. You're welcome to take out your phones right now and follow us on Facebook and Instagram, or simply use the QR code on the screen. We'd love to hear from you, and this is a great way to stay in touch with us. Are you a part of our church family and would like to volunteer and help, but don't attend in-person services on Sundays at Regal? 
Would you like to serve, but in the season, prefer to do it from the comfort of home? There are several great opportunities for you to volunteer just an hour or two a week from home while still being able to make a kingdom difference for Jesus, whether it be in our online service chat team or helping to schedule volunteers for different ministries. To sign up, simply go to our website at nhww.org and click the volunteer link or text the words new helper to 45777. Someone from our team will be in touch with you. We'd love for you to experience the joy of serving Jesus on one of our amazing teams. Do you sometimes feel spiritually dry and could use more power in your life? Ever feel stuck like you just don't have it in you to move beyond some of your inner struggles or past hurts? Next Sunday, we'll be kicking off a brand new message series called Firepower, where we will learn more about the Holy Spirit and what it means to encounter Him in a real and powerful way. So be sure to join us. Well, that's all the announcements we have for you. Today, we have a great message. So would you join me in welcoming Pastor Dave? Well, hey, everybody. I want to welcome all of you at our different New Hope Winter locations. And I want to also welcome all of you joining us online around the world. I'd like to give a few shout outs. I want to say hi to Sean and his family who are watching from Korea. I also want to say hi to Michelle in San Francisco. How you doing, Michelle? You know, we're also super grateful to have Cynthia and LD watching each week from the Netherlands. How cool is that? And I also want to say hi to those of you joining us on the Outer Islands. I want to say hi to Mickey and David who are watching on the Big Island. And isn't it cool that we all can grow closer to God together even though we're in different states and countries? I just love that. I love how technology is helping us grow together closer to God. Well, today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to grow in an area of learning how to experience some joy in difficult days. And I think we all can agree the last 18 months has had some difficult days. And in many ways, you know, as we think about it, I want us to look at the, the many ways that God's Word teaches us how we can have some more joy in these difficult times. Now, before we get into some of those biblical principles, let me first start by talking about some of the things that can steal your joy. I want you to think about what are some of the things that bring you down? These are the four most common joy stealers in our lives. We have pain, it could be physical pain, emotional pain, uh, it could be spiritual warfare pain. Uh, we have pressures, stresses, anxieties, worries. We have challenging people, people issues, difficult people, annoying people, irritating people. Don't look at those people right now if you're with those people. And then we also have problems, all kinds of different problems. And so we've all experienced these killjoys of life. And what they can do is they can keep us from experiencing God's joy. And if we're not careful, they can cause us to even at times feel sorry for ourselves and throw a pity party. I appreciate Pastor Rick Warren. I was listening to a message of his recently, and I, I love his transparency. And he was talking about how he threw a pity party for himself. He said these words. He said this. He said, last Tuesday, I gave myself a pity party. It was a good one. Here's how it happened. First, he said, I thought about the chronic pain that I'd been feeling for three weeks because I'd been sick, and it was really sapping all of my energy. And because I hadn't been feeling well, I thought of all the things I wasn't getting done and the pressure that I felt from those deadlines. So I had pain, and I had pressure. He said, then I thought about the people who needed my help, and then I thought about some other people who were upset with me. And finally, in case that wasn't enough, I thought about all the problems in the world that we keep hearing about. And he said these words. He said, I started holding this pity party for myself. And at one point, I actually thought the words, you know, I don't like any of this. And I am really, really, really not happy right now. Let me ask you this. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever held a pity party for yourself? Sure. All of us at times have gotten down and we felt sorry for ourselves. We've all done it. In fact, it's quite easy to throw a pity party. I mean, all you have to do is think about all of the pain, all the pressures, the people issues, and the problems that you have going on. And you think about it over and over and over, and it's just super easy to get down and discouraged. And you just lose your joy if you have any at that time, you know? And so how do we experience some joy even when we have these joy stealers? How do we do that? 
How do we experience some joy in difficult times? Well, here's what we're going to do is today the Apostle Paul is going to teach us how he handled all four of these killjoys that we just talked about in the first chapter of Philippians. And so let me kind of set this up. Let me, let me show you uh, what was happening in his life because in his story, we're going to learn some skills. We're going to learn some skills that God wants us to learn in difficult days so that we can experience some joy, so that we can experience some strength in, in the midst of our struggles. And by the way, I want to say this. I want to encourage you to listen to the entire message as there are three things that Paul teaches us today, and these are needed to experience some joy in your difficult days. So here's the background of Philippians. In the previous four years of Paul's life, before he wrote this letter, uh, and by the way, he wrote this letter to a church in Philippi, but the previous four years, Paul had spent two years in jail in Caesarea on false charges. Then, if that wasn't bad enough, this guy was shipwrecked while sailing to Rome for another trial under Nero, who was the Caesar at that time. Then, after that shipwreck, he's stranded on this desert island for a while, and he actually gets bitten by a poisonous snake. And then, when he finally gets to Rome, he's imprisoned again there for two years. And this was not an ordinary prison like you'd see in, in today's day and age. These prisons were dungeons. They were dark. They were rat-infested. Uh, all, all these inmates received was bread and water, if that. They're often badly beaten. And so this is the context in which Paul's about to write these words. He had it way worse than most of us. He had every reason to be unhappy. He had every reason to be bitter because of what he was going through. He had every reason to be resentful or fearful or depressed. But instead of having a pity party, instead of getting bitter and resentful, Paul wrote about how he had learned to find joy and how he had found strength in the pain, in the pressures, the problems, and the people issues that he experienced. Now, I realize you may not need today's message, but you will need it in the future. And here's why. It's because everybody experiences these issues. So here's what I've done is I've put these biblical principles in phrases to make it easier to remember. All right. So the next time you're starting to lose your joy, I want you to do what Paul did. And I want you to say it in these words. Here's the biblical principle. I want you to say, I won't let people steal my joy. Now, I have this as the first point because people are the number one joy stealer in your life and mine. And so the next time somebody does something that starts to take away your joy, you just say this in your mind, I won't let this person steal my joy. In fact, why don't you say that out loud? I won't let people steal my joy. Go ahead and say that out loud. In fact, why don't you type that in the chat? I won't let people steal my joy. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the three types of people that try to steal Paul's joy. And I want to cover these because these are the same types of people that are the killjoys in your life and they can steal your joy. See if you have any of these in your life. The first Paul mentions is critics. You have any critics in your life? In fact, everybody has critics and so did Paul. Uh, while he was incarcerated, there were people who criticized his ministry and they slandered him, they judged him, they criticized him. And he describes it this way in Philippians 1.15. He says, it is true that some preach about Christ because they're jealous and they're bitter. Paul says, my critics, they're jealous. They're jealous of my ministry. And so they try to tear him down by criticizing him. Now, the word here in the Greek for bitter is the word eris. And it means that these critics, they liked to argue and debate. Uh, these are the people in your life that are critical. They like to debate. They can be very contentious. Uh, they, they may like to create conflicts in your life. You got any people like that in your life? Now, many of these people, they like to hang out on social media, or they like to hang out in the comment sections or the blogs. And, and I tell you, you know, as you think about it, there are a few things in life that can cause us to lose our happiness and joy faster than criticism. And the reason why is because we want people to like us. So the next time a critic starts to steal your joy, here's what I want you to do. So think about it. The next time a person starts criticizing you, here's the first thing I want you to do. I want you to first pray and ask God if there's any truth in their criticism. Because sometimes people are bringing up things that we take as criticism, but sometimes there's some constructive criticism in that. 
And so you ask God, God, is there any truth in this criticism? And if there is, learn from your critics. But don't let their criticism cause you to get bitter. Don't let their criticism steal your joy. Remind yourself, I am not going to let my critics control my attitude. I will not let them steal my joy. Now this leads me to a really important principle to remember, and, and this is it, is if you're going to have more joy and happiness in life, you don't need other people's approval. You don't need other people's approval to be joyful, to have happiness. Because the bottom line is, is we serve an audience of one. We serve Jesus Christ. And the only person that you ultimately need approval from is Jesus. And so live to please an audience of one because you can't please everyone and you're going to kill yourself trying. Listen, Jesus was perfect and he could not please everybody. And so there's no way you or I can. And so we have to learn to live with people's disappointment, live with their disapproval. Because if you live for the approval of others, here's what's going to happen. You'll get your happiness from whether it's likes on Facebook or Instagram or, or you'll try to get your approval from you know, with how they think, they think you look or uh, if they're in good graces with you. And what happens is, is if we live for the approval of others, here's what happens. We then die by their disapproval. And if they are disapproving, we're miserable. And I tell you, that is just the wrong way to find joy. Don't try to find joy by pleasing everybody. God wants all of us, myself included, to learn that we don't need anybody else's approval to be happy except His. So in the next verse, Paul shows us some other types of people that he has struggles with. And these are competitors. And Paul says this in Philippians 1, 17. He talks about these competitors. He says, Others preach Christ insincerely from a spirit of selfish ambition. So here's, here's the bottom line is there's going to be some ego-driven competitors in your life. Uh, they may live in your house. Uh, they may compete with you over what you wear. They may compete with you over what you drive. They may compete with you over what your house looks like or your job or who your friends are. We're just going to have competitors in life and, and that can steal our joy. So don't let the competitors control your attitude. Just next time you come across a competitor and they're starting to suck the joy out of you, you just say this, I will not let this competitor control my attitude by stealing my joy. I'm not going to let it happen. I'm not going to let this person steal my joy. All right. So we have critics in our lives. We have competitors, just like Paul. And number three, we have the crazy makers. <laughs> Paul talks about those in our lives who are, in my words, crazy makers. These are the people that drive you crazy. How? By stirring up problems, by causing you pain. Look at how he talks about it in Philippians 1.17. He says, others just want to stir up more trouble for me. And they want to add more pain while I'm in prison. So the crazy makers, these are the ones that just stir up trouble for you. Maybe they don't follow through with what they said they were going to do. Maybe they, they were just super irritating and annoying. Maybe they kicked you down, kicked you while you were down, just like these folks did while Paul was in prison. Uh, now, one of the ways that crazy makers will steal your joy is this, and this is really important because we've all experienced it, but they will gossip about you. Gossip. When people gossip about you, it can steal your joy and happiness, right? And it can steal it just as quickly as criticism can. And so here's what I'd say. The next time somebody gossips about you, process the hurt and the anger of being gossiped about because it hurts. It does. It just does. But don't let that gossiper have control over your attitude. You remind yourself, I won't let this crazy maker steal my joy. I won't let this gossiper steal my joy. Because we're going to have these types of people in our lives. We're going to have critics, competitors, and crazy makers. That's what Paul had. And instead of these people stealing his joy, he didn't let them. He didn't let them control his attitude. He didn't let them steal his joy. And here's how he did it. Look at Philippians 1.18. He says this. You know, again, he's just talked about what these people are doing in his life. The critics, the competitors, and crazy makers. And he says this. But it doesn't really matter what they've done. 
The important thing is that in every way, whether for right or wrong reasons, the message of Christ is being shared. So I'm happy and I'll continue to be happy. What is Paul modeling here? This is so important. He's saying, I'm not going to let the critics, I'm not going to let my competitors, I'm not going to let my crazy makers in my life, I'm not going to let them steal my joy and happiness. He says, they've criticized me, they've competed with me, they've stirred up trouble, they've even preached about Jesus with raw motives. But it doesn't really matter in the scheme of life. The Greek words here are tiskar plen. It means, so what? In fact, why don't you put that in the chat? So what? It means whatever. Or as my teenage daughter says at times, whatevs. Whatever. It doesn't matter. And, and so what matters in, our, in dealing with these critics, competitors, and crazy makers is seeing what is God doing in the midst of it? How is he changing me? How is he growing me? How is he using this for his glory? And that's exactly what Paul did. So the next time somebody starts to steal your joy, remember, I will not let people steal my joy. And I want you to do what Paul just did as well if you're taking notes. The next time somebody starts to steal your joy, do this. Just say, I will look for the good God is bringing out of the bad. This is super important. This is one of the big sources of joy that you can have in your life in difficulties if you do this. You look for the good God is bringing out of the bad. Now, there's a famous verse in the Bible. It's one of the greatest promises in the Bible. It's Romans 8, 28, where God promises to bring some good out of the bad that you go through. God specializes in doing that. He specializes in bringing good out of the bad. I mean, think about it. God can turn a crucifixion into a resurrection. And so the Bible says if you love God, He promises. He will take what you've gone through, the good, the bad, the ugly, how you've sinned, how others have sinned against you, and he will extract some good out of it if you follow him. What a promise. He says he'll recycle it. He'll use it for the advancement of his cause, his kingdom. He'll use it to develop your character. He'll, he'll use it to, to bring forth his purposes in your life and in the lives of others. So your job and my job is to look for the good that he's bringing out of the bad. And our job is to trust him to get us through what we're going through. So let's see another example of how Paul looked for the good that God was bringing out of the bad. Philippians 1.12, he says, And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything I've gone through, think about all he went through, everything that has happened to me here, it has helped to spread the good news. All that happened to him in the past four years, the pain, the problems, the pressures, the people issues, all of that had helped to spread the good news. So watch what Paul did. Rather than focusing on how he was mistreated and having a pity party, he looked for the good that God was bringing out of the bad. That's a whole different perspective. And, and let me just take this further. See, Paul had dreams. I mean, this guy had dreams for years to share Christ in the center of the Rome Empire. He probably, he probably was thinking, okay, let's go to Rome, let's rent out the, the Roman Colosseum, and let's have a harvest crusade every night. I'll be the preacher, we'll lead thousands of people to Christ. Paul had plans in his life, but God had another plan for him to spread the good news all throughout the Roman Empire. How? By having Paul become a royal prisoner of the Emperor Nero. You say, wait, wait, so what is a royal prisoner? So back in these days, a royal prisoner, which was Paul in this case, they were chained to a palace guard. So Paul was chained to a palace guard 24 hours a day. You say, well, what's a palace guard, Dave? These were elite, like secret service, handpicked security agents of Caesar. And it was the custom of this time, back in this day, for a prisoner to be guarded in four-hour shifts. So every four hours, a different soldier would be guarding Paul, and Paul would be chained to them. So follow the math with me on this. Paul was imprisoned in Rome for over two years. He was chained to an influential, elite, hand-picked special agent guard every four hours or so. So that means over two years, there was probably over 4,000 different guard shifts where Paul would be chained to these guards. And you say, wait, wait, so what's happening here? What's God doing? 
Well, Paul is chained to people of influence. He's got a captive audience, like no pun intended. And instead of preaching at the Colosseum, Paul's preaching to each of these guards that he's chained to. And every single one of them, they're influential because these are elite palace guards. And what happens is, is Paul says everybody in the palace guard learned about Jesus. Look at where he says this. He says, for everyone here, remember he's in prison, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. So Paul, even though he's in a dungeon, he's chained to these guys 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's looking for the good that God's bringing out of it. He's saying, these guys met Jesus. Everybody knows that. And then in chapter four in Philippians, get this. It says that some of Nero's own family had come to Christ. Did you know that? Some of Nero's own family had become Christians. How? Because Paul was in prison witnessing to the royal guards. And so my point is this, is that, yes, we have our plans and sometimes they're God's plans, but other times he has a better plan, even if we wouldn't choose it. So we got to look for the good that God is bringing out of the bad. If you want more joy, just remind yourself, just say, I'm going to look for the good God's bringing out of this. I'm going to look for it. I'm going to find it. God, help me. Open my eyes to see it. And God, I'm going to trust you to bring good out of this. Many of you know of Pastor Max Lucado. Uh, he's a pastor, a Christian author. And I remember hearing Pastor Max share about a guy in his church. His name was Sam Brown. He did his first tour of duty in Afghanistan, two years out of West Point. But what happened to him was devastating. An improvised explosive device turned his Humvee into this torch, and it just left him ablaze in the sands of the desert. Sam doesn't remember how he got out of the truck, but he does remember taking handfuls of dust and dirt and just throwing it into his face, trying to put out the flames. He remembers he, he finally dropped to his knees and he lifted these flaming arms up into the air and he just cried out, Jesus, save me. And that was more than just an empty prayer because Sam believed and believes in Jesus. And he was asking him, Jesus, save me from death. And Sam really believed that he would die that day for obvious reasons, but death did not come. His gunner came, he helped Sam reach cover from the bullets that were flying all around him by crouching behind a wall that was nearby. And Sam realized that while he was behind that wall that there were bits of, of his glove that had been fused to his skin because of the burning. And so Sam, he, he ordered his private to rip the gloves off of the burning flesh. And, as you would imagine, the soldier hesitated, but you know, he followed his orders and he, he pulled the gloves off. And, and when he did that, off came pieces of his hand. And that was, that was just the first time that would have been thousands of moments of just excruciating pain that Sam would endure over the next few years. Sam's prayer was answered. He was eventually rescued. What happened was another platoon reached them and uh, they loaded the wounded soldier into their truck. And Sam remembers he, he looked into the side of the mirror out of the truck as they were taking him to a place of safety. And as he looked at his face, uh, he said he didn't even recognize himself. And, you know, right before he passed out, he, he just couldn't believe what the fire had done to him. Well, that was September 2008. Within the next three years, he had to undergo dozens and dozens of agonizing surgeries, just over and over and over. Uh, they had to take the dead skin, which had to be excised, and they had to take healthy skin and harvest it and graft it into those areas that were badly burned. And Sam says that the pain chart, it didn't even have a number high enough to register the agony that he felt. And I want to be really clear, God didn't cause this bomb to be planted. He did not cause it to go off, but he did allow it. If you stop and think about it, you say, why would God allow something like that? How could any good come out of that evil, out of that bad, horrific accident? Well, part of the answer walked into the hospital room in the form of a dietitian. It was a young lady named Amy Larson. Now, at this time, Sam's mouth had been reduced to the size of a nickel. 
And so Amy, a dietitian, she was signed to his case to monitor his nutrition intake. And he still remembers the first time he saw her. Dark hair, brown eyes. He thought she was so cute. But more importantly, she did not wince at the sight of him. And after a few months of being there, he gathered enough courage to ask her out. And uh, they went to the San Antonio Rodeo the following weekend, and they went to his friend's wedding in Houston. And during that three-hour drive, Amy told Sam how she had noticed him months earlier in the ICU. So these two, they continued to date each other, and soon uh, into their relationship, Sam asked her if she knew about his best friend, Jesus, and she did not. And so he began to tell her about Jesus. And she found this story of Jesus as inspiring as she found the story of Sam Brown. And so she gave her heart to Christ, and Sam gave his heart to her. And soon thereafter, the two were married. And today, they are the proud parents of a baby boy named Roman. A beautiful boy, beautiful family. And now, Sam directs a program to aid wounded soldiers. Now, no words can capture the horror of a man on fire in, Af in an Afghani desert, right? I mean, nothing can capture that. Nor the torture of repeated surgeries and rehab. And yet, Sam and Amy have discovered the curious math of God. Look at this. War plus suffering equals tragedy. This is the math of common sense. It says war plus suffering, it equals tragedy. But the mathematics of God are different. And the mathematics of God say this. War plus suffering equals a saved soul, Sam's wife, equals a wonderful family, and equals an incredible ministry helping other wounded soldiers as Sam had been wounded. And so, God took that which was intended for evil and he brought good out of it. God brought good out of the bad. And that's what Jesus Christ specializes in. He specializes in bringing good out of bad. Now, I don't know what you're going through, uh, and I'm sure it's hard for many of you. I'm sure it's very difficult and painful. So I don't know what you're going through, but I do know that God promises to bring good out of it if you love him and if you follow him. Now think about it. What if Sam had given up on God? Some of you are feeling that. What if he turned his back on God? What if, what if he let his heart grow hard towards God? What if Paul had done that? What if Paul had given up on God? Lord knows he probably felt like it many times when he was tortured and abandoned and mistreated. At any point, Paul could have said, no more, God, no more, I'm out, I'm done. I'm so done with this. And I would imagine that some of you are feeling that right now. And let me tell you something. Everything in the story of Paul says this, don't give up. Don't give up. Hear the words God is speaking to you right now. Don't give up on him. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on whatever problem you're going through. You look for the good that God is bringing out of the bad. God is bringing good out of your suffering. He hasn't caused it all, but he is allowing some of it to bring good out of it to prepare you for what he wants you to do. Stop and think about the good that's happening in your life right now. You're here today growing closer to God. That's good. You're growing in your character through these problems. That's good. You're becoming more like Christ in it. God is helping you make it through another day. That's good. There are so many more things that are good that are going on in your life. So I want to encourage you, just look for that good. Look for that good that God is bringing out of the bad. Because Paul teaches us that. He says, open, our, open your eyes to it. It's all around you. And as you trust God, here's what he's going to do. He's going to take what is intended for evil in your life, and he's going to turn it. He's going to recycle it into something good in your life. And you, and you and I, we're not going to see all of the good that God brings out of every single thing we go through. Like, we can see some of it, but we can't see the full picture of it. But there will be a day when you're in heaven where you're going to see the magnitude and the chain reaction of the good that God brought out of the bad. 
you'll look back and say it wasn't easy. Uh, you'll say it, it was so difficult, but God brought so much good out of that mess. All right, let me leave you with the last point that we can learn from Paul. And here it is. If you're taking notes, if you want more joy in your life, remember this. Remind yourself, I will focus on serving God's purposes. I'm not going to focus on my problems. You see, this is so true of all of us. It's just, it's just human nature for us to go through life focusing on our problems. And, and what we learn from Paul is that instead of going through life focusing on our problems, we need to go through life focusing on serving God's purposes. See, if you want true joy, focus on serving God's purposes in your life. Here's how Paul said it. He said, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Stop there for a second. Have you ever wondered what does that mean? To live as Christ, to die as gain. He explains it. He says, if by continuing to live, I can do more worthwhile work for Christ, then I'm not sure which I should choose. I, I'm pulled in two directions. I want very much to leave this life and, and be with Christ in heaven, which is far a better thing. But for your sake, it's much more important that I remain alive. I'm sure of this. So, so I know that I will stay on with you all so I can add to your progress and joy in the faith. What was Paul saying? I will focus on serving God's purposes, not my problems. Paul was saying, my purpose on earth is to serve God by serving others. And by the way, did you know, that's one of God's purposes for your life too. God put you here on earth to serve God and others. You were saved to serve Jesus. Now, now don't miss this, this is super important. This is the third secret principle to having more joy. Catch this, true joy does not come from self-gratification. What's self-gratification? That's where you're living for yourself, you're living your plans for your life. It's me, myself, and I, I'm gonna do whatever I wanna do. True joy does not come from self-gratification. True joy comes from doing what God put you here on earth to do. It's, true joy comes from fulfilling God's purposes for your life. It's when you serve God by serving others. Joy does not come from self-gratification. That's not true joy. It doesn't last. It comes from serving God. So if you want more joy, Develop the heart of a servant. Serve Jesus at home. Serve Jesus at work. Develop the heart of a servant in his kingdom. Ask God, God, where do you want me to help build up your family? Joy comes from serving. And so I want you to hear uh, from some of the people who serve in our online ministry. These are people that serve online and, and people who serve remotely in their homes. And I want you to just see how their volunteering has brought them joy in their life. So watch this. My name is Jamie and I serve as an online chat host. I'm a wife and mom of three beautiful girls. The littlest one, Ellie, is only two years old, so I'm a busy stay-at-home mom. I've been serving for about three to four weeks now and it's been really great. My name is Amy. I'm a teacher. My husband is Len and we have two kids, 16-year-old son. Kaden and a 13 year old daughter, Kristen. My name is Mickey Sangaran. I am a wife of 43 years, a mother of three, a grandmother of five, and a retired educator. In addition to being a prayer warrior, I am now the director of the online chat host. Serving on this ministry has been such a blessing. During these COVID times, you may feel like you're not able to connect with people or do anything, but this is such a good way to connect with people and serve the Lord. You know, when I started this, that I wanted to be a blessing to others and help others, but in the end, I'm the one who's getting blessed from serving. It's really the joy of serving that I look forward to every Sunday, and I'm never disappointed. We actually get to meet people from all over the world. But the unique thing about it is that we get to do this all from the comforts of our home. Being a stay-at-home mom for the past two years, I was really feeling the need to put myself out there to serve others. I had actually been praying about the Lord using me, and it's been a blessing ever since. My dad is Mike Mamatsuka, and he's the head of the video team. And he's been asking me for years to serve, and um, I always found excuses not to serve. But recently, through the challenges of COVID, I felt the need to draw closer to God. 
I thought, what better way than to volunteer at New Hope Windward? And the services at New Hope Windward have been wonderful and really helped me get through some hard times. Thinking I don't have anything to offer. They really help you step by step. They take whatever you have and they find a place for me. I really just felt inadequate or unworthy. However, God surrounded me with phenomenal brothers and sisters who spoke words of encouragement and helped me realize the truth. I truly felt God's calling on my life to serve for two years and I didn't want to do it. One day, I heard a message from Pastor Dave and he was sharing his experiences of how he got to test drive different ministries. I love the fact that New Hope offers us this amazing ability to try out ministries until we feel the right fit. I have a little one running around at home. She keeps me really occupied. I'm not able to do as much uh, physically as I, I did before or things in person. It's really a minimum amount of time and it gives me a way to serve people, but still be able to serve my family as well. Since I've been serving on this team, it's helped me in my personal life. The team is just awesome. They're very uplifting. And although we're serving others, it's also interaction within ourselves among other Christians. I think I've drawn a lot closer to God through serving in the ministry. Serving has also helped me in a lot of my other relationships, just with friends and, and family members. It's just helped every aspect of my life. So if anyone needs a little more joy in your life, all I can say is find a ministry to serve in and fill your cup. Well, as we just heard, joy comes from serving God's purposes. So I want to encourage you to test the waters of volunteering at New Hope Wonder. Perhaps you volunteer online or in person at Regal Cinemas. You know, as a church, by God's blessing, we are reaching more people than ever before in the history of our church. And so the need for volunteers is high. So we'd love your help because we can't meet all the needs of the people God's bringing without your help. And so, you know, let me have you consider a few things. I remember the first time I started serving, I realized that, gosh, it, I'm being a part of a team that's changing lives and people are coming into heaven as a result of this. I like to say it this way, there, there's no greater use of your life than to serve God and his purposes for your life. And so let me show you some ways that you can volunteer. We offer a volunteer trial period where you serve uh, four Sundays. It doesn't have to be four Sundays in a row. It's just four Sundays, if you could commit to that, you can check out if a ministry is a fit for you. You can see if you like it, you can see if it brings you joy. And so I wanna encourage you to consider volunteering for Sundays. Perhaps you volunteer online or remotely from your home. We have some ministries here that you could consider supporting. Perhaps you're an online chat host. Uh, if you're familiar with Facebook or YouTube, I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, by the way, we offer training in all of these different ministries. Uh, maybe you're good at organizing. You have an administrative gift. You're good at scheduling. You're a detailed person. You're organized. Oh, we'd love to have your help. There's various needs in the church where you can use those gifts that you're really good at that will bring you joy. We have some miscellaneous projects you can do at your house. Uh, we have a creative media and social media team. Maybe you like to edit videos or you want to learn to do that or maybe you like to post stuff and you could help us post stuff on our New Hope Winward accounts. And so consider these online or remote volunteer opportunities. The other thing I want you to consider is to serve in person at Regal Cinemas. And obviously this is for those of you living on Oahu. And so we have some opportunities in Kid Zone. Maybe you wanna help raise up the next generation for Jesus. Maybe you love kids. Maybe you like being around kids. If you don't love kids, don't sign up for that ministry. Okay, maybe you, you, you could be one of our theater attendance counters. Uh, maybe you could be an usher or a camera operator. Again, we offer all the training that you need to do this. Maybe you could join our sanitization team. And so these are some of the opportunities that you can consider. Now, here's how you sign up. It's not difficult at all. You can use this QR code. So grab your, your phone right now and just shine the camera on this QR code. It'll take you to a link. Or you could text uh, new helper to the number 45777. You'll get the same link that this QR code will give you. It's a really short little form that you fill out electronically on your phone and then somebody will contact you. Or you could go to our website and you can click on the home page. You'll see an area to click there. 
and we will help you find a ministry that fits you. We will help you find a ministry that brings you joy. Here, I like to say it this way. It's a ministry that God prepared for you to do before you were even born. Ephesians 2.10 says that, that God has prepared good works for you to do even before you were born. We'll help you find those ministries, and I'm confident they'll bring you joy. All right, so quick wrap up. How can we experience some more joy in our difficulties? Number one, remember this. Maybe screenshot this. I won't let people steal my joy this week. Maybe you're saying, this one's really speaking to me, Dave. I'm going to look for the good that God is bringing out of the bad. Or maybe this one right here. I will focus on serving God's purposes, not my problems. Dave, I'm going to make myself available to test drive the waters of serving Jesus in our church. And so these are the principles God teaches us through the Apostle Paul. It worked for him. I know it'll work for you. Can you say amen to that? Amen, amen. If you would bow your heads with me, let's uh, go ahead and just go before God and let's pray. As your heads are bowed, um, I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to say the words and if this is your heart, uh, just say me too in your heart. So I'm going to pray. Dear Jesus, I've often allowed the killjoys of the pain, the problems, the pressures, and the people issues in my life to rob me of your joy. But I want that to be true anymore. So starting today, I want to practice these three principles Paul modeled so I can have some more joy in my difficult days. So Father, help me to not let other people steal my joy. I don't want other people to control my attitude. So Father, help me to remember that what other people say or what other people do, it does not have to control my joy levels. And so God, help me to have the strength to not allow them to control my attitude. And God, I also commit today that I will look for the good that you're bringing out of the bad. So God, help me in those times when I don't understand what's happening, when I can't figure it out, and I don't have an answer. God, help me to look for the good that you're extracting out of the bad. God, I trust you. Why don't you just say that out loud? Just say, I trust you, God. I trust you. And lastly, Lord, I will focus on serving your purposes, not my problems. God, help me to, to have a heart to serve, to serve at home, to be a servant at work, and to be a servant in your family. I want to use the rest of my life in serving you by serving others. I was saved to serve you, Jesus. And then I really look forward to being with you and the others that we bring into heaven together. So God, for the rest of my life, I want my answer to be like Paul. For me to live is Christ. I am reminded today, Lord, that the ultimate source of happiness it comes from you, Jesus. And so I give you every air of my life. I give you lordship. I surrender. Guide me, lead me, protect me, and use me all for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, congratulations to those of you who just said that prayer. And I know some of you might want to be taking that step to serve. And so I'll leave this up on the screen here for a few moments for you to go ahead and take those next steps. And I'll be praying for you. I'm certain God will help you find a ministry that he prepared for you to do. That'll bring you a lot of joy. Now, let me say this. Next week, we are launching a brand new series called Firepower. We're going to do a four-week series on the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What is his role? What does he do? And how can he strengthen you and lead you into his plans for your life? So hope you can join us next week for that. I want to once again thank all of you for joining us today. Hope you have a wonderful week and may God fill you with his joy and his peace. Aloha.